And uh, that was the point where we uh, have been yesterday. So I was about to explain how uh, these um, symbolic data structures that are used, for example, in language technology or in computational linguistics uh, can be expressed by means of this kind of term I have passed. And what I have also learned when I'm using the blackboard, I have to zoom in the camera. And I hope it will work now. So the idea is <clears throat> to represent uh, these phrase structure trees uh, by means of the term algebra. And what we have learned yesterday was that the term algebra uh, consists of a so called signature. This is nothing else than an alphabet together with a function assigning an arity to the symbols in this alphabet. So all these symbols of our data structure uh, um, get interpreted as uh, function symbols of a particular um, arity. And so we start with our uh, term uh, description here by uh, writing down NP, which means nominal frames or noun phrase in linguistics, which is simply a constituent in a, in a sentence uh, that is uh, governed by a noun. And this, you see, uh, there are two branches coming out from there. Therefore, it is a function with two arguments. And these two arguments will be the next term. So the next term is this article by a reader minor. And this is a unary function taking only one argument. And then we have here the verb or the constant the in the second place. And on the other hand, the second argument of the NP function is the predicted noun. And in the context of this particular language processing system, which is called a corner parser, uh, predicted categories uh, appear in these uh, brackets here. So this is the first um, representation of essentially the, the um, phrase structure tree of this tree that you see on the left hand side. And then we make a transition. And this transition is mediated, so to say, by processing the next incoming word, which is mouse. And then now we see that we get another structure, namely S, which is a binary function again. It takes two arguments. Then we are, then we have NP, which is also a binary function taking two arguments. And these arguments are D, which is a unary function taking only the as an argument. Now we are still uh, in the um, uh, function NP, and then N apply to mouse this is the next argument. And then we close this bracket and we get a predicted category, namely the second argument of uh, the function S, which is a predicted verbal phrase, how it is called. So and then you see all these structure trees can be represented in by means of uh, bracket uh, invocations of these uh, functions, and this is FFG a term algebra. So now the point is uh, relating it back to our quantum approach that these term structures here shall be mapped onto vectors in a Hilbert space. And formally, of course, we can simply use the Dirac notation. And then we get two vectors in some vector space. But of course, so far, we don't know how to evaluate these expressions. And in order to evaluate these expressions, we have to introduce uh, two further uh, components of the construction. So first of all, all the atomic um, symbols in our signature, so the nullary functions, we say, like the and the predicted n and the and mouse and so, uh, they simply become represented as basis vectors. So there should be a basis vector indicated by this uh, Dirac bracket. And uh, the predicted N is a basis vector. And 
the mouse is the basis vector. Oh, sorry, I left the Spirax brackets. So we assume that all these are basis vectors of some vector space, which I call F. And you will see immediately that this is nothing else than the Fox space that we have introduced in the framework of quantum fields. And then, additionally, uh, we have to introduce uh, so called um, role vectors as basis vectors of this uh, vector space, uh, saying uh, to which uh, position in such a tree representation these symbols um, are attached to. And uh, again, a quite symbolic notation will be that we simply look at such a bifurcation. And then we focus on the mother of such a tree on the left branch and on the right branch. And uh, therefore, we introduce a symbolic notation. This um, extent will uh, be the codification of the mother node in a tree. This will be left branch, and that will be right branch. And all these vectors here are also basis vectors of Fox space. And eventually, uh, we present a recursion formula in order to evaluate all these tree structures here. And this recursion formula simply says uh, that we, if we have a term, with a binary function symbol applied to two terms as arguments, we do the following. The vector of T, the basis vector of T of the symbol T is bound by a tensor product to the mother position, the mother role in such a binary branching structure. Then we take the direct sum and recursively apply the Dirac uh, vector of the subtree of the subterm T1 bound to the right, to the left branching plus E2 evaluated again as a Dirac uh, vector in Hilbert space times the left uh, times the right branch. Then of, then of course, uh, if uh, these are constant in our signature in the, in the term algebra, uh, we are done. So the recursion uh, um, breaks down. But on the other hand, if these are still uh, terms in the term algebra, we have to apply these, this rule several times. And then you see uh, there will be more and more uh, tensor products uh, being involved. And this essentially gives rise to the Fox space function. And now I will immediately continue with our slides. So zoom out again. And Looking back at our slides. So, yeah, sorry. Do you have something equivalent to observables in this framework? Not yet. Ah, okay. Not yet. No. No. Uh, but there are operators. And you see, this is also indicated by, uh, by this expression here. The word mouse uh, that has to be processed in the next step um, becomes interpreted. These uh, square brackets here. Uh, uh, called the interpretation function becomes interpreted as an operator in this space. And well, we, I wouldn't call it an observable, but it's, of course it's an, observ uh, it's, it's an operator on this Fox space, mapping uh, the first tree uh, to the second tree when the trees are represented as vectors in the, in the Fox space. In, the, in, the space. So in that sense, not an observer, I wouldn't say, but it's an, an operator. And so what I have done here is essentially nothing else than uh, um, evaluating uh, these expressions by means of this recursion formula. And 
uh, it's quite instructive as well because you immediately see how uh, these uh, Dirac um, vectors um, are obtained from the tree. The, the first, so all these entries have to be read, so to say, in the Arabic manner from the right to the left. And we start with the mother node. And attached to the mother node, we find an NP in the tree. This is here. Plus uh, the uh, left branch, then the mother node, and there is a D bound to that position. So, of course, left branch, mother node, and there is a D. You see here. Here, uh, left branch, left branch, the attached to that position. Left branch, left branch, the. That's it. And finally, right branch predicted N, right branch predicted N. That's it. And then you see, this is just the uh, description of the first trace structure tree. And uh, the, the word mouse uh, during the processing of this uh, structure becomes an operator acting on this uh, Fox space vector, uh, producing the second uh, Fox space vector here. And this, of course, gives again uh, the corresponding uh, this representation of this uh, phrase structure tree here. And the interpretation is straightforward again. So um, S is bound to the mother position plus uh, left branch mother NP, left branch mother position NP plus uh, left branch, left branch uh, mother position D, left branch, left branch mother position D. Plus uh, left branch, left branch, left branch, the left branch, left branch, left branch, the, and so on and so on. So, and that, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm still not uh, too familiar with the notation, but I, I'm, uh, I'm failing to see what the, yeah, what the plus operator is, is doing here. Which, uh, which operator? So, for example, uh, the attachment of, or the plus. So, so when you have D and you have the, this is not a Laplace operator. Uh, no, no, the, the one joining, uh, for example, the D and the D. Uh, the sum of the sum. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, so, uh, so I, I, I'm just going to come to that point, of course. Well, these are uh, <laughs> direct sums because all these uh, vectors here in the Fox space uh, may be part of different subspaces. Yeah. And subspaces is probably of different dimensionality because all the time uh, you See here, uh, this is a um, second uh, power tensor, uh, and this is a um, one, two, three, uh, four, a fourth power tensor product here. So these are all um, um, elements of different uh, subspaces in this Fox space, and therefore we have to compute the direct sum of these because okay. this applies uh, to the linear combination of vectors in, in subspaces of different dimensionality. So, so this is just a linear combination. So you, it is you, you, uh, essentially it's a linear right. combination exactly. And what you also see here that of each of these entries here encodes one path to the, to the tree here, and the entire tree is then represented as the superposition of all these paths. So, if it, so for example, in the, the spin example, it would be just a superposition of spin in one direction and the other, and just yeah, as some of the yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is your vector space is defined by this uh, basis element as the as the free vector space over the real numbers or in our applications we are always using uh, vector spaces over the real space. Yes. Okay. So far, but what yeah. would be some scalar function of of this then, or what what would be like if I have one half uh, of n p or you basically it would be a normalization so perhaps you may uh, have to normalize your vectors no i'm just not clear why you why you need a vector space structure if you if you don't have like really uh, yeah. like uh, any Good point. Or... this of course this is the, the final part of the application because uh, i'm talking about the application in the framework of self vector symbolic architectures eventually uh, you are interested uh, for example in the neural network implementation or in the symbolic processes and for that aim uh, you uh, 
so now here I have uh, described all these uh, basis vectors quite abstractly. I said they should be a basis vector of this Fox space. But now we can uh, realize these basis vectors as um, arithmetic vectors in some arithmetic vector space, like R2n or something like that. And then this will be the next image here. Uh, then we are able uh, to uh, create a huge vector space because of all these tensor products with almost exploding dimensionality. That's the reason uh, uh, that what people are talking about hyperdimension computing uh, in that framework. And uh, we can do some kind of dimension reduction uh, using uh, principal component analysis, for example. And then you see that uh, this processing here from one tree uh, mapping to another tree becomes a trajectory in this vector space. And so we are representing this symbolic process here, this kind of computation or this kind of cognition, so to say, uh, as a dynamics in such a high dimensional space. And then we can tr train a new network, of course, in order to reproduce exactly this uh, trajectory here. So we are starting, so to say, with a vacuum state. Uh, then the first word the um, becomes processed, leading to this uh, point in this three dimensional projection. Of course, it's not the entire space, it's just a three dimensional projection uh, spent by the three uh, largest uh, principal components. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so so you, I, I understand that yeah, you can see like a sentence with a trajectory in this yeah. uh, dimensional space. Yeah. But so what's the relation between that and the summation? Because so, so from the summation, I intuitively understand that okay, you, you get all these three points and you get a combination of them, which is another point in the space. Mm -hmm. So so you're saying that the trajectory, so so in this encoding, the trajectory has the same information than just the linear combination of the points? No, not the trajectory, the individual points here. Yeah. They are the representatives of the vectors and therefore of the trees. And the trajectory uh, encodes the transitions from one state to another state. And so in that sense, uh, uh, the, the interpretation of the incoming word that has to be processed uh, becomes, so to say, a, a, a matrix acting on these vectors in the vector space. Okay, but when you are adding, you are having the summation of B and N and mouse, uh -huh. Isn't that a linear combination of those points, or maybe I'm missing something? No, first of all, this is just the um, uh, three dimensional projection according to yeah, the yeah, yeah. But yeah, in this picture, this high dimensional vector space, yeah. since each instance can appear zero or one time, isn't it like always on the edge of some hypercube? Yeah. Depending on your representation, but if you decide to represent all these basis vectors as canonical basis vectors in an arithmetic vector space, then uh, you would have exactly this uh, encoding. Ah, okay. Yes. yes. So one could also use set two, for example. Or okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But here you see this is the background uh, of, of that research uh, that we are interested in uh, building eventually uh, new network uh, implementations of uh, these symbolic processes. And yeah, that's essentially the thing here. But, yeah, so, wants, yeah. so, so, so I understand that uh, the other, like uh, left branch, right branch, mm -hmm. the DMP, they are also points in this space. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, Yesterday, I have uh, already said something about quantum fields. Uh, let me uh, just uh, mention the um, particular case of fermions once more. Uh, so in the Fox based representation of, a fair, of the fermionic field algebra. So we have seen the fermionic field algebra is spent or is generated by the polynomials in these two operators. And these operators are parameterized by the uh, single particle uh, states in a, in a uh, single particle Hilbert space. Uh, but the particular um, issue for fermions is, of course, uh, that the occupation numbers can be only zero and one. So 
uh, as I have said yesterday, uh, we can uh, create this um, occupation number representation, uh, which is an, a function mapping the single particle Hilbert space uh, to the non zero integer in the general case uh, in such a way uh, that for each, uh, each, state, uh, each state in the Hilbert space of the single particle, we assign the number of particles which are actually in exactly that state. But for fermions, <laughs> things are a bit more simpler because fermions can only uh, be in a state or not be in a state. You, you cannot have two fermions in the same state. And therefore, the Fox space of a fermionic, fermionic system becomes this function, uh, namely the set of all functions from the single particle Hilbert space into uh, the set zero and one. And this relates again to our ideas about um, quant uh, about um, qubits, about quantum computation, uh, because we can consider these as qubits again. And <clears throat> uh, because the, the Hilbert space of a single particle is assumed to be separable again, uh, the Fox space of the fermion system is then isomorphic to uh, what is called an infinite uh, chain of qubit spins. And then, of course, we have the ground state, so to say, we start with this one, and then we say this state is not occupied, and probably the uh, first excited state is occupied, uh, the third is not occupied, and so on and so on. And so uh, essentially, the Fox space becomes this set, namely uh, the um, space of sequences over the numbers zero and one. And I will come back to this example uh, quite later because uh, this makes now a connection between quantum fields, what we see here for fermions, um, for uh, um, lattice systems, I will explain it a bit later, and even for symbolic dynamics in classical systems. Well, another um, point I would like to mention in the context of representation theory, uh, that now we are dealing with the meaning or with semantics. So we say that the uh, representation from a C star algebra into uh, the algebra of bounded operators over some Hilbert space defines a kind of interpretation of the abstract C star algebra through the operators of the concrete C star algebra. And of course, we apply uh, the a representative of an algebra element to a vector and obtain a second vector. And for that also, we uh, found an interesting application in the context of our own research. But essentially, that goes back uh, to ideas uh, of um, Skinner uh, quite several decades ago. Uh, and Skinner was talking about the, uh, what he called the ABC uh, schema. And we have realized then that this could be related to these ideas about quantum cognition. And in particular, uh, there is a research field called dynamic semantics. Uh, dynamic semantics of mental states. This is essentially uh, the work by Peter Gerdenfoss. So what, is, what does this mean? So we assume there is a cognitive agent, a robot, for example, or of course a person, and we as, uh, assign uh, to its uh, mental state uh, some vector in a very high dimensional, very abstract way, but so, uh, R. so this is the antecedent state. This is my present state, of the present state of my mind, so to say. And then uh, I get a me message from you. And now I have to process your message. And this message is verbal behavior when you're talking to me. So we have an antecedent A, we have behavior B, and you are uh, talking to me uh, because you have several goals with that. You try to convince me about it's uh, time to have a break or something like that. And so finally, I uh, come up into a consequent state. And what has happened is then uh, that uh, the interpretation of your behavior is an operator acting on my antecedent state in order to obtain my consequent state. This is the basic idea of dynamic semantics. And interestingly, 
something very similar has been um, elaborated in computer science, uh, because in computer science, you can imagine uh, that uh, the state of, of your computer, if you have a, a, a laptop uh, somewhere, the state of your computer is nothing else than a, a pattern of bits and bytes uh, in, in the memory. And this is, so to say, a very high dimensional vector. And every instruction in a, in a computer program is nothing else than an operator acting on that vector, um, making a transition from that vector to another vector. And so the, the meaning of your, um, of your um, instruction becomes interpreted as an operator in the vector space spent by all the possible configurations of your computer. And in computer science, this is called like the notational semantics of computer programs. Well, uh, I have uh, talked about uh, representations of these diagrams. I have also already introduced the notion of group representations, namely of uh, an arbitrary group uh, on the automorphism group of such an algebra. And now we can combine both concepts together in order to uh, define the meaning of an implementation. And here we consider an abstract star algebra and a pi should be a representation of this algebra in the Hilbert space. We assume that there is an element of the automorphism group of the C star algebra. And then we say that such an automorphism can be unitarily implemented in the representation if there is a unitary operator mediating uh, the effect of the automorphism. So that means uh, we start with an algebra element A, we uh, compute its uh, operator representation in the Hilbert space. And we can also uh, um, take the, the image of A under the automorphism and uh, take the um, operator representation of this image. Second. And then we should have this, uh, um, this identity here that the operator of the image of A under the representation, the image of A under the automorphism should be the same as a unitary transform or similarity transform of the operator uh, representation of this element of the algebra. And in that case, we, we say that the automorphism can be unitarily implemented uh, in the corresponding representation space. Now I think Zephyrim is quite interested in the, in the next point. We can define uh, irreducible and reducible representations. So what do we mean by irreducibility? So let A be an abstract C star algebra and P again be a representation of that algebra in the Hilbert space. Then we consider a subspace of the Hilbert space. So now we say the represent representation is called irreducible in the case that uh, this subspace should be considered invariant under all the elements, under all the operators uh, in, the represent in this representation. So we assume this should be an invariant subspace for the representation, but then this should only hold if the subspace is either the null space or the entire Hilbert space. So it means that the representation space does not contain any non-trivial uh, invariant subspaces under this representation. If this is not the case, if you find an invariant subspace that is not the null space and not the entire uh, Hilbert space, then we say such a representation is reducible. And can uh, provide an example for that. Again, coming back to the uh, algebra of, of spins of qubits. <clears throat> so uh, the two basis states, uh, spin down and spin up, live in a two dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And this is uh, characterized by the value of the corresponding observable, which is one half. Right? A spin has uh, the 
spin measurement uh, one half. And what is written here symbolically is uh, we can couple two spins together in order to get a composed system. And this must be done, of course, uh, looking back to our introduction uh, by uh, computing the tensor product. And of course, we can compute the tensor product of two spin one half systems. And it turns out that this tensor product is uh, a reducible representation, which has two sub representations, namely uh, one with spin zero and one with spin one. And so one speaks about a singlet space. So this is simply a one dimensional uh, subspace of the uh, representation space uh, having spin zero. And there is this triplet space uh, generated by the linear combinations of these three vectors here. And they are all um, having spin one. And interestingly, if you uh, look at this particular uh, vector in the representation space, you will find that this is an entangled vector. This is an entangled state. I think I don't have the time to prove that, but we could do this uh, later on if you like. So you have to compute the uh, um, trace of that uh, cause of the corresponding projector and uh, marginalize that, of course. So here we have uh, clearly we have an example for a reducible representation. But we are also interested in irreducible representations. But let us uh, stick with, uh, uh, with, with reducible representations for the uh, next time. Uh, let us consider such a reducible representation of the C star hyperbola. And then, of course, we know there should be a, a subspace that is invariant under uh, the representatives of the algebra. So there should be an invariant subspace. And then, of course, we already knew what we have uh, seen um, two days before, I think, uh, that uh, in any uh, case, there's an invariant subspace, there's a projector uh, mapping onto the subspace. And now it's uh, straightforward to prove that this projector, or so to say the, the operator mediating, mediating uh, the um, projection in the representation space, that one belongs to the center of the um, um, generated uh, representation of the algebra. And therefore, the operator corresponding to this projection commutes with the representatives of all the elements of the algebra. And the conclusion is it must be therefore a classical observable. So for reducible representations, we get classical properties. And here's the proof. And you see, it's only involving algebra. We don't work in the Hilbert space anymore, uh, um, except from the first line. Of course, here we uh, simply uh, use the fact that uh, P projects the entire Hilbert space into that subspace. Then we say that um, P of A for every algebra element A uh, should be invariant on that subspace, an invariant operator acting on that subspace. And nothing changes if we apply P once more to this uh, invariant subspace. But of course, uh, we don't need this, this second application of P. Uh, it's also sufficient to use simply this representation here. P maps the Hilbert space into the invariant subspace, and P of A uh, remains in the invariant subspace. But of course, this holds not only for A, but also for the adjoints of A, because we are in a C star algebra. And now we can simply take the adjoint of this expression, and then we uh, compute according to the rules uh, that we have for the evolution, and eventually we get this result. And this means essentially that this particular projector P commutes with all the operators representing the elements of the algebra, and therefore it must, in the must be in the center of the algebra. And so we have proven that there is a classical observable. Peter, can I ask yeah. one question regarding this? So if I go back to the von Neumann postulate, yeah. and if I go back to the Hilbert space, how does this translate? Right. This is exactly the next point. Uh, from one of von Neumann's uh, postulates was uh, that the entire algebra of operators uh, is 
um, could be possible or observe adjoint operators could be possible observables. And that means there is no invariant subspace. And that means there cannot be central projections and therefore there could be no classical observables. So he, the, the, for Neumann uh, made exactly this irreducibility postulate. And this irreducibility postulate says there are no invariant subspaces in a, in a particular representation. And this excludes uh, the possibility to consider classical observables. But if we relax for Neumann's irreducibility postulate, we immediately get the freedom to describe classical properties in such systems. But in, in naive sense, like suppose I don't know anything about algebra, and for some reason I'm a physicist, I'm not trained in mathematical physics, physics. I have two observables and they, they commute. Mm -hmm. Isn't that just an example that for sure I can find no. cases? No, and, and I will come back to one particular example uh, in a minute. Uh, no, no, it, it must really be the case that uh, this, op this particular observable commutes with all other observables. It's not sufficient that you only have uh, two commuting observ observables. And additionally, uh, this observable in a given representation uh, must not be a multiple of the, of the identity. Ah, okay, right. So I, I see, I think, I get it. Yeah. Right. So, so what? Yeah. Okay. That, that's why then you recover the classical system. That is all Excellent. my observables. Of course. They commute. Yeah. Okay. Right. And now we are in a position to introduce some further notions that are um, of relevance for the um, following discussion. So, first of all, consider again such a reducible representation of a C-star algebra in a Hilbert space, and we, of course, because it's reducible, there should be an invariant subspace. And this invariant subspace uh, should be um, obtained by a central projector. Of course, you have just seen that it must be a central projector, a projector commuting with any observable. And now we can uh, uh, define from the uh, present representation pi a new representation by simply uh, doing this uh, transformation here. So simply. Restrict, restricting the domain of our representation into one of the subspaces. And this, of course, yields just another representation of the algebra, uh, not on the entire Hilbert space, but only restricted to the invariant subspace. And such a uh, representation that we can have, uh, always construct by means of the central projector is called a sub representation. And then two other important concepts are now, or actually three important concepts. Uh, first of all, we can say that two different representations in two different Hilbert spaces of a C-star algebra, they are called unitarily equivalent. If you find a mapping from the first Hilbert space into the second Hilbert space, and this should be an, an isometry with respect to the scalar product, or it should be an, a unitary transform, uh, with respect to its algebraic properties. And if this formula holds, so there is a similarity transformation uh, of, the, this, uh, of the representation in the first Hilbert space into the second Hilbert space, then they, these representations are called unitarily equivalent. And now we can combine these two uh, concepts of a sub-representation and of unitarily equivalence, and we say that two representations in two different Hilbert spaces, H and K, uh, are called quasi-equivalent, if just in case if they possess unitarily equivalent sub-representation. So it's not necessarily the case that they must be uh, unitarily equivalent over their Hilbert spaces, but we should find uh, sub-representations of both of them, and they should be unitarily equivalent. Then we talk about crazy equivalence. And this is really an important point. If two representations are neither unitarily equivalent nor crazy equivalent, they are quite disjoint. 
So two representations in two different Hilbert spaces of one single C algebra are called disjoints if they are neither unitarily nor quasi -trivalent. So, and now we brought so many uh, different concepts together that we are able to formul formulate uh, the two most important representation theorems. And in fact, we have seen uh, something uh, about uh, this uh, in the previous examples. But now, in general, any abstract commutative <laughs> billion C star algebra is isomorphic to the algebra of continuous functions over some topological space. This has been proven by Gelfand and Neumark. And so here again, you see how classical systems can be described in the algebraic framework because a classical system always involves a, a phase space. And any abstract commutative C star algebra can be represented uh, by the algebra of continuous functions over a topological space. And in our examples, we have either looked at uh, compact uh, house of spaces or n dimensional hypercube, for example. And the topology of the space is completely described by the algebraic properties of this abelian C star algebra. And moreover, any abstract non commutative C star algebra mm -hmm. is, in fact, isomorphic to the algebra of bounded operators over some suitably chosen Hilbert space. And this has been proven by Gelfer, Neumark, and Siegel. And this is an important construction for the, uh, for the effective um, construction of such uh, representations. And I will come back uh, to this at the end of my lecture because it's so important. So there are no other possibilities. Either we have a commutative C star algebra, and this immediately implies the existence of a phase space for this classical system. Or we have a non-commutative C star algebra, and this immediately apply, uh, implies the existence of a Hilbert space. And you here, so you, here you see uh, we don't say anything about the Hilbert space before that. But it follows automatically, so to say, by means of the proof here provided by Gelf and Neumann and Siegel that there must be a Hilbert space. And the uh, C-star algebra must be represented by the bounded operators in the Hilbert space. And now I come back to, uh, to the irreducibility postulate. Uh, this is uh, another uh, related representation theory, namely, for quantum systems with just a finite number of degrees of freedom. So for example, for a, for a spin system or the qubits studied in uh, quantum computing, or for the particle in the box system that we have seen, uh, which moves along one direction, or even for a particle that moves in three-dimensional space. All representations of the I say ontological C star algebras are unitarily equivalent. This is the so called Stone from Neumann theory. And one, in, one particular example uh, that uh, has been uh, proven quite early in the, in the history of quantum mechanics, namely by one of the inventors of quantum mechanics himself, by Erwin Schrödinger, was. Uh, the equivalence of the Heisenberg picture, what Heisenberg called his matrix mechanics, and the Schrödinger picture, what was uh, called the wave mechanics, they are unitarily equivalent representations of namely the underlying Heisenberg or Weyl algebra as a C-star system. And also that way, okay. Yeah. Wait. Uh, now for something completely different. Okay, uh, we come to another topic that is important in this respect. And for that, I simply repeat uh, some of the slides you have already seen about ordering relations, just very briefly. Uh, so let us consider a set and uh, an ordering relation uh, in the um, Cartesian product of the set. And we have seen that uh, this relation can be quite reflexive. 
if x is smaller or equal than x, transit, transitive. If we have uh, this formula, x uh, smaller or equal y, and y is smaller or equal z, then x also smaller or equal z. Antisymmetry, uh, totality, either that one or that one holds, and directiveness. And directiveness becomes important in the following. <laughs> Because we are now uh, going to define uh, what is called a directed net. Uh, so again, such a relation was co uh, called a crazy order if it's reflexive and transitive, semi-order if it's reflexive, transitive, and antisymmetric, linear order for reflexivity, transitivity, antisymmetry, and totality, and directed order finally, if these uh, things come together. Well, and now we introduce another technical notion that is a net. So let us look at such a set and another set that um, plays the role of an index set for uh, indicating elements of that set. And now in mapping from the index set into the sec into the uh, base set is called a net of elements in case. Yeah, just in case uh, that the index set, I have already presented it here, just in case the index set exhibits in a directed order. So that's the, the point that we need here, that we are able, we must be able uh, to give an ordering relation between the indices and this uh, translates to the cross elements of the base. And this can be now used uh, for the definition of spatially extended systems. And you see, again, another uh, um, necessity, uh, necessity for uh, talking about quantum fields, for example. So let us consider a topological space and let us uh, consider a set algebra over that space. Must not necessarily be a Borel set in that case, uh, but a set of bounded open regions in this topological space. And we should expect there is a directed order. So we can uh, indicate uh, all these uh, bounded open regions uh, by the ordered index set. So let now A be an abstract C star algebra. And now we introduce this mapping from a bounded open region in the topological space to the algebra that we are looking here. And this defines a net of local C star algebras over this topological space. What does this mean? Essentially, uh, that this leads to the uh, notion of crazy local algebras. So we say a C star algebra is called crazy local if there is a net of local C star algebras indicated by this mapping. So L is a bounded uh, open region uh, from the set algebra. And this maps uh, to a subalgebra of the uh, total C star algebra uh, in such a way that if uh, one region is a subset of another region of this topological space, the corresponding algebras should, should, should be subalgebras of each other. So the algebra associated to the region L1 should be a subalgebra of the algebra of the region associated to of the algebra associated to the region L2. This is called isotony if we have this property here. And now we talk about locality, namely if two regions are disjoint to each other, the elements of the corresponding subalgebras should commute. So this is quite interesting. It simply says, uh, of course, we are uh, considering observers within these algebras, and all the elements of the algebras of the algebra associated to the region L1 should commute with all the algebras uh, associated to the region L2. And that means uh, they do not perturb each other during measurements because they are spatially separated. That's Has this some implication with classical system? I'm just trying to. Of course, it will. It will. Yes, precisely. This is basically at the core of the relation of classical properties next. 
where we call this locality. And here you see, this is quite interesting because for quantum systems, we have realized that in the state space, in the Hilbert space, states can be entangled. And this is highly non-local. And now we have seen that there are these, uh, there's this list of peculiarities from uh, pioneer quantum mechanics. How can we bring together the, uh, the requirement of locality coming from special relativity that uh, no effect can propagate faster than light? And on the other hand, there, are, there is this absolutely non-local entanglement in quantum systems. And this is now the solution. In the algebraic framework, we can clearly conceptually separate um, both issues from each other. Namely, locality is encoded in the structure of the algebra. But still, entanglement can be encoded in the structure of the Hilbert space. They are clearly separated. These systems now allow the um, treatment of locality in connection with the treatment of entanglement. A few remarks are necessary on that. Of course, first of all, in relativistic quantum fields, the real our topological space is four dimensional Minkowski space time. And here uh, we have to uh, take exactly the requirements of special relativity into account. And that means uh, that we don't not uh, only have to uh, look at disjoint regions uh, in, this, in this space, uh, but uh, towards uh, disjointness uh, regarding special relativity, of course, and that means uh, that there must be there must be space-like disjoint regions in Minkowski space. That means uh, one region uh, does not influence another region if they are not connected by a light cone, because if they were both situated within the same light cone, there could be signals <coughs> influencing one system or one measurement in, in one position in space time from the other one. Yeah. So, so what does this mean in terms of our intuition and, and meaning? For entangled, entangled states are not associated to space time at all. Is, is, I don't know. So, so entangled state as they, they, are, they, no they, they have so, they have, so to say, a, a, an existence uh, that is uh, transcendent of, of, or that transcends uh, space time. But this concerns the, the states of the system. And I have not yet uh, explained uh, the, the notion of, of state within algebraic quantum theory. I will be doing that later on, maybe today or tomorrow, if time allows. We have to uh, postpone this uh, question now. So then, of course, uh, we still have this global algebra of observable, and mathematically speaking, uh, we see that becomes the so-called C star inductive li limit of the net of local algebras. So still, there are global properties, not only local ones. And here's the first application, well, not really an application of algebraic field uh, theory, uh, but it's again uh, related also to uh, some of our works that we are conducting together. Just an application of a spatially extended system in neuroscience, where one can study so called neural fields. And neural fields are described by a classical field, so a quantity uh, that has a particular value at some point in space and at some point in time. And usually these fields are. Uh, the dynamics are described by these kind of uh, integral differential equations, the, the so-called Amari equation here. And then we can uh, assume that there are spatially separated um, populations, neural populations, which is um, sketched here by this kind of neural network. But in fact, it is not really a neural network, but because we still have uh, this, uh, the case that the system is spatially extended. And then it's possible to train such networks in such a way that uh, they uh, exhibit a kind of heteroclinic dynamics. And here's just one example for such a simulation. So uh, this is a, a neural field defined on this square. So at each position, we have, so to say, some neural activity. And uh, neural activity is uh, replicated as the grayscale scale of this figure here. And we have we were able to uh, construct the, exactly this uh, synaptic uh, 
uh, connectivity, connectivity matrix in such a way that uh, the system circles down these uh, three um, patterns here. But still, there is one point where we could apply these ideas of hydrophile quantum theory. Namely, what happens if such a classical neural field um, becomes driven by stochastic forces? And this question has been addressed uh, by Jack Cohen quite recently, and he argues that we can uh, treat such a neural field under the uh, driving of stochastic forces like a quantum field. And then we, again, we would have uh, to use algebraic quantum field theory for the description of such systems. Well, let me come back uh, to our quasi local algebras, because now we can uh, make another uh, comment on, on the definition of an observable. So, this is a picture from a cloud chamber, a classical picture for where some particles have been. Uh, proven. And now again, we don't look at the entire space. You have already seen another uh, peculiarity of uh, um, pioneer quantum mechanics was uh, that we always have to restrict our space to a, to a certain volume in order to uh, obtain a very defined Hilbert space and bounded operators on that. But this can be done now. So we select one local region in space and define an observable associated only to this local region. And I remember that we have seen that observables in the, also in the, in the traditional picture of quantum mechanics have been described by the spectral decomposition uh, into uh, measurement values um, of the spectrum. So I values that appear in the spectrum and there was a projector wave measure on the spectrum in such a way that the global observable can be obtained in that way. Now we simply uh, leave out this integral, uh, summing up all the contributions from different regions here from this measure set, from this measure space, but simply saying we can define a local position observable by uh, multiplying the expectation value of the position with the projector associated to that region. That's it. So now we are able to give an example for such quasi-local observables here. And you see uh, the basic ideas about that approach were already encoded in pioneer quantum mechanics, namely by the idea of, uh, that there are projector valued meshes. And now it's straightforward uh, to provide the algebraic picture for this. Well, next, we come to a particular example, which is uh, computationally more uh, tractable than uh, quantum fields in general. And these are called lattice systems. So in order, and of course, for any kind of computation, even in the case of that neural field you have seen before, uh, we had to uh, discretize our, our grid where the neural field um, um, has uh, some values on a, on a spatial lattice in that case. And this is generally done in the framework of so-called lattice systems. So what do, do we hear? Uh, we provide a graph. And the graph, you know, is, a, is a, uh, an ordered pair of a set of vertices. And in the general case, we assume that the vertices are elements of z to some uh, dimensional v. So here, for example, we have a two-dimensional lattice, but can also look at uh, one-dimensional lattices. This will be the next slide. So the vertices are assumed uh, to be a discrete uh, grid in all uh, different space dimensions or probably uh, space and time dimensions. And at each integer point, uh, we assume there is uh, such a vertex. And then we assume there is a set of edges connecting two vertices. Uh, so there's one initial vertex and one final vertex. They are connected by an edge. 
And if we only take a subset of all these possible combinations, we obtain a graph. And what do we know? We assign a quantum system to each vertex of this lattice. So for example, we assign one spin to each vertex of the lattice and the spin can have a, um, orientation upwards or downwards. And so formally we assign uh, one uh, spin degree of freedom to each side of the lattice or corresponding uh, local Hilbert space. Well, this is just for illustration. Let me explain this in a bit more detail on a one dimensional lattice. So this is now called a, a quantum spin chain. And by the way, uh, when I uh, uh, made my, my, my first um, and I wrote my diploma thesis, I was actually uh, concerned with exactly this kind of uh, structures in mathematical physics. So we assume that we only have the integer uh, line as a lattice. We, assume, uh, we assign a spin to each lattice side and therefore we assign uh, the vector space C2 to each sign, because this is a Hilbert space for such a uh, spin system. And now it's clear that we uh, can take any uh, subset of integers and associ associate a local C star algebra to all subsets of integers. But of course, there are smallest subsets of integers and these are the uh, single points on the um, on the integer line, on the integer uh, graph, so to say. And so we can start with uh, assigning one algebra to each individual lattice point. And then, of course, we can obtain formally the global C star algebra by taking the tensor product of the local algebras over all the lattice points. So x. Uh, goes uh, over entire Z, and then you see immediately that we have a system with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And then remember there was this uh, Stone von Neumann theorem that all uh, representations of systems with a finite number of degrees of freedom are um, unitarily equivalent, but this does not hold for such a system, even for such a simple uh, spin chain. But now we have to uh, um, observe some caution because we only may define so-called local operators. And that means within this infinitely extended tensor product, we simply uh, write down replicas of the identity operator. And only at one particular position here, we insert one of the possible spin operators from the Pauli algebra. These are so-called, these are now the local operators. So we assign to this, uh, the side X in the chain, an operator from the Pauli algebra. And of course we had uh, S1, S2, S3. And well, maybe this is a bit confusing now. We should not so say SX anymore because X is now the, the index. <laughs> Uh, in the spin lattice. So we say SI indicating the three uh, Pauli matrices here. SI assigned to the position X in the lattice. And then we can write down the fundamental commutation relations. And now, of course, you see there, are, there is an infinite number of fundamental commutation relations. They are written down in that sense. The commutator of spin I oper or Pauli operator I and Pauli operator J at positions X and Y is given by, of course, uh, I as, is the structure con constant. So everything here is a structure constant, of course. But now we have simply have Kronecker data for positions X and Y. They are all commuting, which is other. This is the, namely our locality constraint. They should commute if they are spatially separated. This is the chronic data here. They commute when they are not the same or when they are spatially separated. And then here we have this levy pivota uh, symbol, uh, totally anti symmetric uh, tensor uh, of uh, rank three. 
And then you see this uh, mediates all the possible com combinations and permutations of the spin operators here. So this is essentially the fundamental commutation relation from the Pauli algebra, but now uh, taking locality into account uh, by the appearance of the con operator. But now let us consider two particular representations of two particular states, I would say, or configurations, I should say. So let us consider one uh, configuration of the spin change where all the spins are aligned uh, downwards. So we can express this by qubits, of course. So that means qubit uh, zero assigned to every place in the spin change. And of course, you already know again, uh, this is now, so to say, the occupation number representation. Relating it back to that. Why, why is it restricted to um, 0, 1 to the power of 7? Because, ah, well, this is just an example. Of course, in, in, in general, we have uh, the Hilbert space of one spin here. So it's z squared to z. This should be the this should be the Hilbert space. Yes. Yeah, you're right. So uh -huh. our principle, our our Fox space, so to say, is the square to the power of z, namely the set of all functions assigning uh, c star vector uh, c uh, square vector to all the lattice sides. That's true. But for this particular example, I only take the cubic c one part. Okay, so let us consider this configuration where we assign the qubit zero to every lattice point, and let us consider another configuration where we assign the qubit one to each lattice point. And now one can argue that these two particular states they correspond to two disjoint representations of the spin algebra. Why is this the case? Well, intuitively. We can prove it uh, quite straightforwardly. Neither of these two configurations can be transformed from the other one by applying a finite number of only local spin operators in their corresponding Hilbert spaces. Our local or quasi local algebras <laughs> only allow the application of local operators. Of course, there are global operators, so there would be some operator that flips all the spins immediately, simultaneously, but this is not allowed in our framework of local operators. And we see that there is no transition from this configuration to this configuration uh, by a finite number of spin flips, and therefore they are disjoint. Well, and this is now the point where we see that uh, we have found two disjoint representations for such a quantum spin system. And that means there must be classical observers in the system. Because they are disjoint, they are neither uniformly equivalent nor quasi equivalent, and quasi equivalence uh, would indicate the existence of some. Uh, unitarily equivalent subspaces, but now we see this, this showing this. Well, now let us look for possible applications again. And the, the following ideas are more or less a research program, so we haven't worked uh, at that uh, so far. But first of all, now it's important for spatially extended systems to study symmetries. So here, what do you see? This is a gray plane, and you don't see anything. From the point of symmetries, so we can uh, look at one particular position, and we see, well, we don't see anything, so we can move somewhere else, and the system is actually the same as before. And so, the system is apparently translationally invariant, and we can also make a rotation, and we don't see even more details here. 
So this gray plane is very symmetric uh, with re uh, respect to spatial translations and also to spatial rotations. And in physics, that is uh, expressed by human homogeneity in space and isotropy in space. But sometimes you find patterns, and patterns um, are associated to the existence of discrete symmetries. So here, for example, this hexagonal pattern, uh, this uh, tessellation into hexagons, we clearly see uh, that this uh, uh, complete uh, spatial symmetry is broken and only one particular symmetry remains, uh, namely the sixth uh, diagonal group is the spatial symmetry of this pattern. How can we express symmetry in this framework of spatially extended systems? In the following way, the space, this, topolo this topological space that we have uh, introduced for the definition of this net of local algebras should be assumed to be a space uh, to be a topological group as well, where we can uh, employ a group uh, um, operation, and this is interpreted as spatial translation in our case. And now we again need this idea of uh, group automorphisms, of the automorphism group, uh, namely. If there is a representation of this topological space into the automorphism group of our algebra, so to each point in space we assign one particular algebra, uh, one particular automorphism, mapping elements from the algebra into elements from the algebra, and if this um, representation, if this group representation. Uh, has this property here, which is called the covariance condition, that um, applying the, the automorphism associated to the position X to the algebra associated to some region L should be the same as moving the entire algebra uh, from the position L to the position L plus X. And then we talk about the spatial symmetry. So once more, more general, uh, let G be some group with a faithful representation in the automorphism group of the C star algebra A. Then we say G is a symmetry of A in general. Now we can also distinguish between so-called internal symmetries and spatial symmetries. We say G is called an internal symmetry if it commutes with the spatial translations, leaving each local algebra invariant. And we call uh, G a spatial symmetry if its elements act uh, volume conserving in X such that we have exactly this property, which is a generalization of the covariance um, property that we have introduced before. So we are now looking at uh, the presentation uh, theta of the group G into the automorphism group of our algebra, uh, assigning uh, a mapping from algebra elements to algebra elements uh, as assigned to each uh, group element here. And then if we have this uh, covariance uh, property, then we talk about the spatial symmetry. Here you see the group applies to the region. For example, this could be the, uh, a rotation now. Could be also rotation with respect to another symmetry group, the hexagonal symmetry, for example. And in that case, we have a spatial symmetry. And here's a possible application. So these are two different spatial patterns. Again, this is the uh, pattern with this hexagonal symmetry. We know there is a discrete symmetry group uh, that can be formally implemented. Uh, in the automorphism group of an algebra. Well, and this is a more, in, more complicated pattern. And actually, I haven't seen the symmetry of that system at all. Maybe you are able to see the symmetry. But uh, relating uh, to, to uh, problems in pattern recognition, it would be important uh, to uh, look at the corresponding symmetries and to express them 
as symmetries of local algebras, of quasi local algebras. So well, it's, it's translation invariant, no? Yeah, so, yeah, clearly this is translation invariant. But the question is whether there are more spatial symmetries involved. And of course, there are, I think, but the, yeah. Yeah, also it has a rotation symmetry. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Like, of the um, fourth. Yeah. And, but also, also uh, translation is broken because it only allows uh, translations for certain amounts, not for the entire. Or for all real numbers, so to say, it's broken. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. 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 So this is just a speculation how this framework of algebraic quantum theory could be relevant for, for uh, problems <coughs> of pattern recognition somehow. Uh, but this is speculation currently, and we don't know. Another important think that we can address in the framework of um, lattice systems has been called lattice gauge models or lattice gauge theory. So look at look, let us look at a lattice that is simply given by this triangle here. So we have uh, a graph which is this triangle with three vertices and three edges connecting these vertices. And as I said in the lattice in the quantum lattice system, we assign a local Hilbert space to each vertex. So the system can be uh, can have a, a state vector indicated by uh, this, uh, this arrow here, for example. And of course, these could be, well, they are indicated here as uh, um, vectors from R2, but of course, we can also associate uh, vectors of C2, for example again in the case of spin systems. So to each vertex we associate a Hilbert space and corresponding a state vector. But now interestingly we can also associate uh, other uh, properties to the edges as well. And in that particular case we associate elements of, of, of uh, a particular group to the edges. So our lattice is exactly given by uh, this triangle here. We assign state vectors from a local Hilbert space, for example, of the space uh, C2 to the vertices. But now we can assign also uh, elements in that case of the circle group to the edge. And you know that the circle group, the group U1, uh, is the gauge symmetry of the, the spin. Uh, Hilbert uh, uh, space. And so let us look uh, what could be the consequences of this assignment. And of course, we are now speaking about internal symmetry, there are no spatial symmetries, because we have the freedom uh, to make these associations here. Well, we have some freedom to choose these state vectors here. So, and that means we can uh, um, um, go into a representation of, uh, of a group, applying these operators to our state vectors. And this is indicated here by the red arrow. So we can make a transition from the blue arrow here uh, towards the red arrow. And this is a rotation of the state vector which can be uh, achieved in, in that way that we apply a local element of a symmetry group, uh, represent this as an operator in the Hilbert space and get another state vector. But then having chosen these group elements for each vertice, for all the vertices here independently, we can also um, rescale, so to say, the assignments on the edges, namely we have to multiply the group element associated to the edge from x to y by the inverse element uh, of the group that we have chosen for the group element of uh, that we have chosen for the um, position x and the group element that we choose for the position y. And this allows us now 
what is called gauge to gauge the system in a different way. So we have one initial assignment of uh, state vectors and group elements here, and now we gauge the entire system by making uh, local um, transformations uh, of the states associated to the vertices, and likewise equally uh, to make uh, local um, ad adjustments uh, to the group elements assigned to the edges. And in our special example, of course, I said uh, we have to spin Hilbert space here and we choose uh, these gauge transformations as elements of the circle group acting on the Hilbert space. But now we can compare both situations. So first of all, we can try uh, to compare the state vectors at different positions here. And this has to be mediated somehow by the group element associated to the edge. And then we make this gauge transformation. Yeah, I introduced this uh, prime here, this bar now. And then we can uh, make the co following comparison. So we apply uh, a representation of the group applied to the edge between x and y, multiply or let this act on the uh, transform state vector in x. And then you see we have to apply. Uh, exactly the sketch transformation here. F prime is simply given by the um, um, modified uh, gauge at the edge. And this is, uh, has to be applied uh, to the representation given in X multiplied by X. So here, we, of course, we have a group representation. We can um, bring all these expressions together. Then we can uh, further uh, compute that one here. And here you see uh, there is x inverse and uh, x. So g inverse at x and g of x can uh, cancel this expression. And finally, we get here again the original uh, state in y. And this is now the transformed state in y prime. And this, if this property holds, we speak about gauge invariance. And if this gauge invariance is broken, we talk about frustration. So these systems are quite frustrated. And in physics, frustration is very important because frustration in physics explains forces. So all the um, gauge theories that we have developed so far in the standard model of, of particle physics are related uh, to frustrated gauge symmetry. But again, because uh, we are thinking or we are speculating about applications in the framework of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, neuroscience, let me try to speculate a bit further about this point. So we have already seen, mainly in the context of dynamic semantics, uh, that agents uh, change their state of mind under the impact of meaning. And we have argued that uh, the, the meaning of an utterance or of a verbal behavior becomes an operator acting on the state space of, of an agent. But now we can assume that all these that different agents um, are connected to each other within a communication network. And my idea, my suggestion now, and essentially it's not really my idea because my supervisor, when I did my diploma thesis, um, has already suggested that 20 years ago, means that uh, these lattice gauge uh, theories or lattice gauge models could be used as a very abstract representation of communication networks. Of course, there are um, the agents associated to the vertices or to the vertices of the network, and now the edges correspond to the communication channels. And these communication channels may be maybe disturbed, they may be noisy, something like that. And the point is now, if such a communication network uh, would exhibit this property to be gauge invariant. I would say that 
all, this, all the agents here in the network that they could uh, agree, they could find a common ground of their communication. But if this is not the, not, not the case, and my speculation is this is actually the case in our post-factual societies, that people cannot communicate successful with, with, with each other anymore. And probably the reason for this is that our communication networks are highly frustrated today. So I don't know what's the time action. Uh, let's see. What? 12.36. Yeah. Hmm? 12.36. Oh, okay. Still time. okay, then I come to my next application. But I think we all have to digest this a little bit. But wait. So, so Peter, yeah. just extending this thought, yeah. this, this in general could be applied to um, internet, for instance. Of course. Or neural networks. Neural networks, yeah. Yeah. of course. Yeah, of course. And in fact, this is a good point, of course, because uh, we, we know that, that there is a connection between particular neural networks, namely hot field networks, and spin systems, namely spin glasses. And in these spin glasses, frustration plays a very important role. And now one can think about uh, applying the ideas of frustrated uh, connections in spin glasses to neural networks in general. But I don't know what the concept of frustration in spin in, in such models. What does it mean? So maybe you know what does it mean? Frustration in that context. Mm -hmm. So it's not yet in spin glasses like in. Spin glass spaces, you have frustration leads to like multi stable mm -hmm. space, you know, like energy landscape too. Yeah. 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 Can I face face equilibrium states? Ah, okay. Multi stability states. Multi stability. Okay. And of course, this is the same in all networks as well. Mm -hmm. right. you, you don't find a global minimum of the energy function uh, for uh, evolution of the network. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, this idea is a bit uh, too speculative, but I have another application again uh, relating uh, to our own research. Uh, this was work I have essentially done with Steiner Brutner over the last couple of years. And this is uh, to apply the ideas of gauge symmetry to music cognition. Well, music cognition uh, is um, related uh, to um, scales and keys. And here's a representation that is often used in, in music psychology and in musicology, of course. This is the so-called circle of fifths, that the 12 tones of uh, Western music and also Chinese music can be arranged in such an order uh, that we have, for example, the, uh, the, the tone uh, C, and this is followed by G as its dominant, it, it, uh, its precursor is F as a subdominant, and so on. And those, this is uh, one basic ingredient of, of music uh, psychology and, and musicology, of course. And what can be done now is that people uh, here, uh, Kromanzel and Kessler, a couple of years ago, a couple of decades ago, uh, they have uh, conducted experiments uh, how well a particular tone that was played on a piano, for example, uh, fits into a given scale or fits to a given key. And the results of this experiment are given, is given by uh, these dots here. And if we arrange uh, the tones along the uh, circle of fifths, exactly in that order here, as you see, C is followed by uh, G, followed by D, and so, and then we come back from F to Z, to, to C again, one or four, one of play uh, higher. The question is, can we find a, a, some kind of law connecting these results of the likeliness, how a tone fits? To the scale. And of course, uh, this is the data given for C major. And the tone C is the so called tonic of C major. 
which is so to say the, the stability anchor of the of, of the key, and therefore C should fit uh, best to the scale of C major. And then you see also uh, G fits quite well. And interestingly, also here you have to speak uh, that E fits quite quite fits quite well uh, because all the three tones here, C, G, and E, uh, they together uh, comprise the so-called tonic triad, the main uh, part in this scale. And they fit quite well to the scale. And then all the other tones uh, fit more or less good. But here the black uh, bullets indicate. Uh, these are all the tones that do not belong to the scale. They are excluded from the scale of C major. And they have the, the, the uh, poorest rating. So now one can ask, can we find some, some law to describe this curve here? How the uh, rating uh, is related to the tone given in, this, in the circle of fifths. And here you see a first attempt, namely, looking at the angle between the tones here in the circle of fifths. And from the angle, you can compute the cosine, of course, and then you can uh, um, build a, a square of the cosine in order to get a positive number uh, reflecting probability or likely likelihood. And you see there is already a quite good correlation. Actually, the correlation is about 0.7 or something like that. But this is, that was uh, our first idea. And Reinhard and I have started this work, uh, whether we can improve this fit here. And the idea is now uh, to introduce a kind of deformation of the angles here along the circle of fifths. And what we have done then was, first of all, we uh, deformed this cosine similarity function. And additionally, we, only, we did not only use one of these curves here for the fit, but we introduced uh, three curves provided by the uh, three tones from the tonic triad, Z, G, G, and E together. And exactly E uh, gets replicated here in our new model by the speak. And what is quantum there? Because we interpreted this cosine similarity function as a wave function defined over the circle of fifths. We took the square modulus of that. So we were translating the wave function into a probability in the, according to the rules of quantum physics. And interestingly, uh, the uh, result that we have plotted here now uh, indicates a kind of incoherent superposition of the three states associated to the tonic trial. But even more important is that we get a, a very good fit now. The correlation is 0 0.99. Uh, By means of this deformation, and the deformation we have further uh, elaborated in our most recent study was given by a gauge symmetry, namely, by the special orthogonal group in two dimensions. Yeah. So, so are you assuming a continuous space or? Yeah, in our approach, we are using a continuous space, but of it course. Like it would be so like very similar to this quantum I think seconds. Yeah. And in principle, you can also introduce a lattice model only looking at these discrete points at the circle of fifths, mm -hmm. and then you would have kind of lattice gauge symmetry. But the crucial idea now was again exactly not looking at the um, uh, at the scala uh, value for the, 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 the um, associated to the to the node that is vertices here, but uh, we use a two-dimensional internal Hilbert space, and then it turns out that we exactly need this particular gauge group in order to explain our data. Yeah. Sorry, can you explain again what the, the points are, what the rating of the, the points is? Yeah. I, 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 I was told not to do that, but I will try. So I can turn on the speaker. I try. Yeah. I try. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay. This was the this was the this was the Okay, no feedback at all anymore. Fine. Well, this was the, the design of the experiment. So, uh, the, the, what is called a primary experiment, priming experiment in psychology. Uh, the the uh, subjects uh, um, get a stimulus, which is called a prime. And in this experiment, you always hear the particular chord. And this chord establishes a key. And so if you hear a chord, so if, for example, uh, the, the uh, C major triad, so um, C, G, and E together, then subjects, at least subjects with a musical background, but it also works for light layman uh, to some extent, they know uh, the, the following notes are played in C major. So, there is a prime presenting or establishing a, a particular key, and then one single tone. And the people had to rate how well does this tone fit to the key? It was primed just before. And then in, in these so, so this is experimental data. Yeah, this oh, is okay. exactly. okay. experimental data. And then the people had the uh, opportunity, opportunity uh, to rate the, the fitting on a uh, zero to seven scale. And seven is the best fit and zero is the worst fit. And these are the experimental data. And then of course you have to uh, do this experiment over many, many trials, always establishing a key and uh, as a prime and ask, then asking uh, how well a single node fits into the key. And after all, uh, one gets this kind of pattern here. And so now our, our point was whether we can find a kind of mathematical description, not really a mathematical model of that. And the first idea was simply to rearrange the notes, the probe tones that have been asked to, rate, uh, to be rated uh, along the circle of fifths. And then we already get this 0.7 correlation. And then we try to further improve the fit, and this led eventually to our gauge symmetry. Yeah, so and this is really an, an interesting application in, in music. Can you repeat a little bit of the superposition here? Or what was exactly here? Yeah, it's it's called an incoherent superposition. Uh, I talked about mixed, no, wait, well, yes, I, I did, of course. Uh, it, it is related uh, with the difference between, yeah, with the difference between pure state and density operators. But, but you never see this No, probably not, right. no. So, for, sorry for, for mentioning that, I, I will not distract you, um, but yeah, well, so in, in, in quantum physics, you can do ki two kinds of superposition. So you can compute. Oh, maybe I see in again or all this other. So this is the superposition state, and then. Uh, in order to um, get a probability um, um, <clears throat> distribution or a, a probability estimate from that, you have to uh, compute the um, expectation value, or basically the scalar product of this state. And this will give, uh, give you uh, something like 
a square. So all the states are normalized, of course, a square, plus e square, but also some mixtures. Mm, I'm not quite sure how this will work. But of course, they, they might not be orthogonal to each other. And maybe something like that. So, and this is called a coherent superposition because you always get these interference terms. And in a co coherent, you said. This is coherent. coherent. Yeah. But in an incoherent superposition, you don't have these oh, oh, it interference terms. Sorry. I was going to copy. <laughs> sorry. sorry. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not sure. So I, I will not. Uh, Make this computation in all the details. Uh, no, it should be. Hmm? Yeah, you are right. Because you added in both. Um, like, uh, Wait, then. Yeah, let us, let us do this the proper way as mathematicians would do. This is. A conjugated by plus B conjugated times A by B by. And then we have to take all the expressions together. Uh, oh. <laughs> This is modulus a square. And of course, we assume that these are normalized vectors. So this is exactly what I have already said. This is this. Now B. This it should be the case, right? This right? Okay. So, and this is called a coherent superposition because you have all these um, interference states here. And in an incoherent superposition, you will lose these interferences here. And then you only get a square plus B square left. And this is exactly what we have done in this, what we have done in this modeling approach. Right. So in this, in this example, so, so I imagine I will have, so for example, the frustration case, I will have some data from a network. It would be mm -hmm. a classical network model and find that there's frustration on it. Or in this case, I will just filter no, uh, some sinusoidal uh, representation of this and as so so what so my point is uh, so so we could think of a of a way of studying this problem with classical methods mm -hmm. so and so we, oh, we so yeah we could have this fit and see okay there, it seems there is this symmetry or there is this frustration in the coupling uh, between nodes mm -hmm. so, so what's um, the advantage of, of using this in, in these examples, what's the advantage of formalizing? In, in this application, I don't talk about frustration that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, there is frustration involved because we have this uh, this gauge symmetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I mean is that both the, the previous example uh, about frustration and this example, I can imagine a way of studying the problem using classical methods or models. But so, so it's in the case where so in this case, for example, in this case, um, so, so what are you gaining by representing the problem in? Oh. So, so you, you, do you have a, like a better description of what's the in-house symmetry there? Yeah, some, sometimes, sometimes these quantum models 
for cognitive processes. They are um, sometimes uh, one, one simply argues that such models are much uh, more parsimonious. So, for example, of course, it is possible uh, to to use kind of Markov processes in order to describe all the uh, stochastic um, parts of of cognitive uh, um, problems. Mm -hmm. But then usually uh, this involves a large number of parameters. And you have to fit all the parameters. And in particular here, with this particular uh, model here, we only had one parameter that we really had to fit to the data. And so it was much more parsimonious than all the classical problems. But still, and maybe we will find the time for further discussion uh, as well. That there are really there are things in, in uh, cognition uh, that really require a kind of quantum treatment or quantum-like treatment or quantum-inspired treatment, and one of them is order ordering effects. So, for example, when you um, make uh, studies uh, using questionnaires, you have uh, to observe the, the number, the, the ordering of your questions, in order to observe, to to get results. And the, the most famous example for that was uh, a questionnaire uh, about uh, preference of preferences of, of voters in the US. And the people have been asked, um, do you think uh, Bill Clinton is honest and trustworthy, or do you think Al Gore is honest and trustworthy? And just be uh, in, dependent on the ordering of these two questions, they got incredibly different results. And this really this argues uh, in favor of a kind of non commutativity and therefore for a quantum like treatment. But also, what is striking about your model in the in the um, your quantum model is that you you could relate back to what um, experts feel, right? Like this idea of. Um, of forces that they feel precisely. That's, maybe you could show the model. Maybe you have a model that you could show them. Not today. Maybe we will still have the time. But of course, you, you are right. And this is really an important point. When we have uh, established this uh, gauge symmetry here, we have been able to derive, so, so to say, a Schrödinger equation with a Hamiltonian operator. So the, the force operator, I can say, or the energy operator. And this comprises exactly three kinds of forces that have been metaphorically into, introduced in this uh, musicological um, research. So people in, in uh, music psychology always speak about that, that music um, exerts some kind of gravity to the mind and some kind of magnetism to the mind. And there is also some kind of inertia uh, in, in musical pieces. And we were able to identify exactly these three kinds of forces in our gauge model. On a very abstract level, of course, but still we were able to do that. Okay. Uh, do, you still, do we still have time? Uh, let's see. Look. No, it's, it's done. It's done. Okay. <laughs>